So my name is Christian Renault. I'm the research director for the Internet of Things at 451 Research, which was acquired almost a couple of years ago by S&P Global Market Intelligence of S&P 500 fame. So uh, I'm going to be moderating the panel today. Is the edge really eating the cloud? And I have some great panelists uh, that are going to join us along with yourself, Saeed. Should be a good time. And there's Tony. Important. And there's Muneeb. Hey, and they're all coming in. Fantastic. Um, hey. So maybe if it's all right, Saeed, um, what we'll do is we'll ask the panelists to do short introductions of themselves so everybody knows uh, who's who here. Hey, Tony, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, happy to. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Tony Shakib, and I'm a, a general manager partner at Microsoft in the Azure IoT engineering team. Great. Uh, Muneeb. Hi, um, hi everybody. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Muneeb Minhazuddin. I'm the, the Vice President for Edge Compute at uh, VMware, uh, building the new Edge business for VMware. All right. And last but not least, in dodging hurricanes, Keith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Keith Basil, I am uh, Vice President of Product for Cloud Native Infrastructure at SUSE, and I also help structure SUSE's global edge strategy. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming today, guys. This should be a fun time. Great way to kick off this event. Um, so the session uh, is called, Is the Edge Really Eating the Cloud? So let's maybe start with that. Uh, there's been a lot of hype. Um, our, what do you guys think in response to, I guess, let's start out with hyperbole. Um, is the edge eating the cloud? Is this uh, going to be the beginning of a, the pendulum swing back from centralized cloud computing to completely decentralized edge? Or is there some equilibrium in the middle? Um, Keith, do you want to start us off? Well, thank you for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Why don't you went on mute? So I pick it on you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, happy to take the question. I I don't. Okay, so here's here's what I think. Cloud is not going anywhere. Nobody's eating the cloud. Okay, so that's that's a hard and fast, strong requirement that's going to be here for the next you know twenty thirty years. The edge though is very important because uh, I think the Linux Foundation predicted that the edge would be four times larger than the cloud. Um, so if you believe that, that's that's a good indicator of where things are going. But I see uh, not a pendulum swing from cloud to the edge from a decentralized perspective, but just a partnership or an extension between the two. Um, and I'll probably stop there and, and leave it for somebody else to uh, add to this question. But um, definitely not eating, but definitely growing on the edge. All right. Fair enough. Um, Tony? Yeah, I think the answer is yes and no, right? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, each one of them have their own unique functions and capabilities. You know, the beauty of the cloud is you virtually have, you know, unlimited compute and storage. So for really advanced workloads, especially, you know, machine learning, you know, like really advanced type stuff, the right place to do it and to train these models is in the cloud. But then, you know, you can't run everything in the cloud. You know, there's so many things that have constrained type of requirements that you got to do it in the, at the edge. So we believe in this hybrid approach where there is a well-orchestrated way to distribute the workloads, run the ones that make sense in the cloud, and the ones that you got to execute them at the edge, do it at the edge. So that's what we believe in, and I think that's the right architecture. Okay, fair enough. Madib, I see you nodding. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think, um... You know, we we look at how the the workload. You know, coming from VMware, we've looked at data center evolution to the cloud. We always kind of monitor what's the the workload distribution going to look like for applications. So, uh, and you know, we constantly survey our install base. You know, about every year. So, what we've seen emerge out of you know about thirty thousand users within you know VMware kind of tell us locally that you know. In the next five years, that workload distribution will look somewhere, somewhere along the lines of 30% in the data center, 40% in the public cloud, but 30% at the edge, right? So that workload distribution is an important thing. Um, and it's right now at about a 5% of the deployments at the edge, but accelerating to you know almost 30% of the lion's share. So we see that the reason to give you that stat is that equilibrium will exist where people will have to have that balance. And I think really where, you know, um, as Tony and, and Keith pointed out, the workloads are key. Um, and what's happened is really in the last, you know, 18 months, more and more emergence of uh, people trying to operate these remotely at the edge has driven the adoption rate of this. It's, it's not the edge hasn't existed, right? Um, it has always been there. It's just people are now more open to remote 
working environments as well as therefore driving compute closer and closer to that remote environments. And I think that's the balance you strike is. So that's the edge has always been there. That's probably a good point. Saeed, I was going to ask you how that how would how this reflects what you're seeing in the data, um, because Yes, there have been operator consoles. There's been servers locked up in a cage or a closet off the manufacturing floor for yeah. years. So how, are, how do you see the difference between that and this newly hyped edge computing fad trend? Yeah, the well, I, I think, you know, I think a couple of things. And uh, so I, I agree and disagree with a few things said today. But but I, oh, I think first good. of all, <laughs> I think first of all, um, edge is, is new, right? Collecting data at the edge of the network, I think that has been done, right? And again, it, you just look at industrial manufacturing, SCADA, you know, has been there well before cloud, you know, or anything else we know, right? So we've been collecting data, that data is being used uh, to, to make decisions and everything else. I think the difference is that data was never connected to the network or the data was never injected into a cloud or anything else. When you start doing that, I think you're starting edge computing. Right? I think that's sort of the first step, because if you don't have a cloud, you don't have an edge. I think that's very simple. Now, is, is edge going to eat the cloud? I think it's going to change the cloud. Um, and I think it's because, to, to the earlier point made, is like the amount of data that is going to come from the edge is going to drive a different architecture of the cloud. In some way, the edge is an architectural change of the cloud. Now, will it change the business models? Potentially, will it change um, technologies for sure? Will it change, uh, you know, the, the 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 companies that are going to be, you know, leading in this space? Absolutely, I think that's going to happen for sure because it's just such a shift. And frankly, it's one of the fastest shifts we're going to be seeing. And cloud was a fast shift too. I mean, mm -hmm. to, we've started 2005 with cloud, and look at now how much it's taking out of the budgets uh, today in IT. I think edge is going to go faster, and I think that's been all, anyway the learning from wow. from the technology industry. Every new trend goes faster than the last one. Um, so I, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that, very good observations, everyone. And I think it's, it's interesting. I think the theme that I heard from everybody is that there is somewhat of a continuum or there's an, a natural equilibrium between the edge and the cloud and horses for courses is what I always say, which is some workloads will naturally gravitate one way or the other. Um, we've heard a lot about it. Do you guys think it's overhyped, underhyped? I mean, um, Manib, you mentioned 30% of workloads. I think our data is that um off the top of my head i think it was 40 percent of workloads are in the iot side so sort of industrial workloads end up eventually getting to the cloud but the majority of those are handled at some intermediate step in between on the device itself or maybe the closet or the cage or on-prem data center or colos or hosters or something like that um so is is this going to you mentioned you thought it was going to be far larger many than uh than the cloud uh what is sort of the general consensus? Maybe we can go in reverse order. I don't know, Saeed, if you want to jump in or Manib. Oh, go ahead, Saeed, yeah. No, go ahead, Manib, I want to see if you go ahead, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I believe, um, you know, as I said, the initiatives have been there. And the reason we're not doing this in you know, a physical location and remotely doing this, the last 18 months, a lot of those initiatives have been accelerated, right? So uh, the need for, you know, retailers to create socially disintermediated retail experiences, the need for manufacturers to, you know, look at localized supply chains and, you know, <laughs> disintermediate, you know, supply chain concerns um, and create automotive, you know, um, processing. They were all pipe dream that was there. What's happened is all those initiatives have been accelerated in the last 18 months because necessity has driven them to go down the path. Um, that is the, the driver because suddenly you have retailers wanting to, you know, create omni-channel retail experiences, socially disintermediated at the edge. Manufacturers want to uh, and give predictive maintenance outcome at the edge, right? So not like the initiatives kind of cropped off from anywhere. They're always there. They've just been accelerated in the last 18 months. And what's that driven is to Saeed's earlier point, processing of data locally, right? So how much of the you know data are you going to backhaul and process it? So how in real time are you going to do this? How much are you going to offload and unload? So uh, yes, it was probably, you know, a hype and things in the, you know, 
three, four, five years, right? Uh, uh, but what's really changed in the last 18 months, the, the way of life has changed, the way of doing business has changed, the business models are moving more towards the edge and driving more data and innovation. And I believe that is the accelerant that we've been kind of waiting for in this space um, that's driving the growth. And it's not like this is gonna go away, <laughs> right? I think it's just uh, accelerated that investment and that's where it's slightly different this time around. Taib. Yeah, um, great observations, Muneev. Yeah, so the perspective I have is, I mean, cloud has been hyped for many years too, right? I mean, back uh, in the last uh, part of the last decade, everybody was like, cloud is the future cloud. Nobody was doing cloud at scale, maybe behind, besides Netflix <laughs> and some other online companies that really needed to scale fast and saw the benefits of scaling on cloud, right? But, but the majority of the market and the majority of enterprises were still, you know, I would say dipping their toes in the water, but not yet committing. And frankly, I think if anything, the last couple of years and, and definitely the last 12 months, I think people are moving in droves to the cloud. And, and we can see that in earnings and everything else that, that cloud companies are reporting, right? So, so cloud is now mainstreaming, right? And it was a hype and Edge is going through the same, right? So in the beginning, Every cloud, every company that's not a cloud company call themselves an edge company. It makes sense, right? I think that's sort of a good way to start off. But I think we are now yeah. seeing, um, you know, edge mainstreaming and becoming real. And one of the reasons I believe that is real is there's verticals that don't exist in the cloud. Finance, financials have always existed in data centers, right? <laughs> Mostly, um, and online companies exist in the internet and in the cloud. But when you are an oil and gas company, or you're a manufacturing company, or a retailer, or you're an automotive company, your business is not done in the cloud. Your business is done in the physical world. And as you go and move everything to the cloud, you need to connect your assets to the cloud, then edge computing becomes a topic. And that's what we have seen, that the acceleration of cloud, especially in these maybe traditionally more lagging verticals, is now driving the adoption of edge. And I think it is absolutely beyond hype at this point. Fair enough. Keith, Tony, you guys violently disagree? Um, I don't violently disagree, but there is there's an undercurrent here that's not been spoken yet. Um, so the word accelerate has been mentioned several times already. Um, and what we see on the SUSE side is that the edge opportunities are cloud opportunities, meaning that um, we are reusing our learnings, our tool set, the approaches that we have you know honed in the cloud. To, to apply to the edge deployments, for example. So like when people talk about hybrid cloud, that baffles me because if anybody's serious about cloud native infrastructure and deployment, everybody's using Kubernetes, right? There's nothing hybrid about a CNCF standard API, right? And so if you build your tooling, your GitOps process and all that to speak to the cloud versus a cloud at the edge, right? Using the same API, it's it's homogenous. And so that that's an interesting play. And so I think the standardization, that's kind of the undercurrent that I mentioned earlier, is the main thing that's driving the move to the cloud in the adoption of the cloud. So Said mentioned these various industries. What we're seeing is that we've got to modernize these industry uh, players to adapt cloud philosophies and approaches to implement their edge strategy, right? And so mm -hmm. that that's kind of the, the big picture as we see it. Okay. Tony, anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, we have a different perspective, you know, the way you know, I think there's a lot of hype in terms of the terminology of edge cloud. And, you know, when we talk to our customers, it's not about a choice between one or the other. It's all about the digital transformation. Like, how do we really help them create value? And then, you know, that digital transformation ultimately results in a optimized architecture where it makes sense for it to drive certain workloads in different places, right? We have always have believed in a distributed architecture, in a distributed decentralized way of running compute, you know, as it requires based on that workload, based on that application, based on the transformation that we're driving. Now, what has really happened recently that's creating that, you know, flexibility is, is that the cloud savvy customers are much more comfortable you know, managing and migrating workloads, you know, between these different places, you know, sometimes between the cloud and sometimes at the edge, and they're not afraid to bring them to the edge anymore, right? And the technology is just getting a lot better. We have single management pane and work, you know, portability workloads that makes it easy. We have unified security and identity 
that puts them, you know, that was the inhibitor to doing that before they were afraid. Now they realize that actually the workloads are much more secure in the cloud or on the edge extension than if it was just running on prem. You know, they can manage it better, respond to, you know, a lot of the malwares and other situations. So it's just that whole notion of like, what is the right architecture for that application, what the customer is looking for. And it's gonna be a hybrid, decentralized, distributed workload that we just need to make it easy to implement, develop, and deliver for them. That's the way we look at it, not a hype between this versus that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a continuum, I think. And we've done a lot of economic analysis, obviously, as an analyst firm on what workloads work best in what venues based on the amount of data, exactly. um, what the sample rates are. Obviously, there's uh, both technical, financial, and then also <clears throat> data sovereignty issues at play that come into when you're talking about uh, edge computing and which execution venue is best suited. What are you folks seeing as far as uh, the workloads that naturally gravitate towards the edge? And for example, uh, Tony, you mentioned some industrial context as Saeed did. Um, yeah. Are there workloads that naturally gravitate towards an ed edge implementation yeah. and others that gravitate towards the cloud or work collaboratively? What do you say? Yeah. yeah, what we see is that there's like three areas where it makes more sense for some of the workloads you know, especially like when you talk about AI or digital twins type applications, that makes better sense for them to run them on the edge. You know, one is, you know, the workloads that are mission critical, you know, that redundancy is required, that if the cord is cut for whatever reason, they can't stop the operation. You know, you got a Walmart store is transacting at a certain rate, the business has to go on. The second one is where, you know, latency is really important. You have critical factors, you got robotics, making real-time decisions, again, that has to happen. And, uh, you know, like we've done a lot of work, for example, with Telstra in the industrial manufacturing using a 5G and edge AI workload that they just can't wait for the round trip to the cloud before they shut down a robotic that's operating machine that's operating near people or, you know, even autonomous vehicles and things like that. So those things, it just, it, it makes sense for it to run it at the edge. And then the third area that we see is where, you know, the data generation just outstrips the bandwidth that could be sent up to the cloud. You know, you've got, you know, especially in oil and gas and process manufacturing, or even in retail, you know, we have, you know, edge AI workloads that is adding vision AI, you know, to the existing cameras, right? that you know you just can't there's a massive amount of data that's being generated you just can't bring it all to the cloud and process it it makes sense to process it at the edge so per, per, so predominantly is those three areas where you have a ton of data redundancy is important latency is important excellent anybody else want to jump in on that one no, I think uh, Tony kind of hit kind of the, the same areas we see, right? So it's always going to be, yeah, I think um, data gravity, data kind of, you know, is a big driver in this on how, where you're going to place that, you know, workloads. So the workloads with the larger data, so totally agree with him on on that. I guess the the balance again, like we we're talking about, you know, between the uh, the edge and the cloud is really you have fast inferencing models that might be happening at the edge, whereas the, you know, the training modules could be like breaking down those three things that Tony said. The in inferencing may be local at the edge. The training could be in the cloud because then you get the benefit of learning in one edge side and replicating to all edge sides, right? So yeah. be it in a manufacturing plant. So that's where the equilibrium is really well done. But you know, I think large amount of data, AI analytics, but even breaking that uh, AI ML model of an inferencing model, a training model, all working together um, is is the equilibrium you kind of hit in here. And it's efficient because you learn, you know, predictive maintenance cycles in one manufacturing plant. And if you have hundreds of plants, you can replicate that to digital twins and all all that efficiency everywhere else. So, right. um, so you get that balance. And in a data center city, security though, I think it's one of the interesting aspect of it, right? So. Um, it does expose, you know, some of my experiences talking to our customers is try to move those workloads that they natively built in, you know, using any, you know, Kubernetes solution, EKS, AKS, GKS, have you, um, readily running those workloads at the edge. They are having to, you know, do some amount of refactoring, replatforming. It's not a straight lift and shift. 
um, is what we're learning. Um, you know, they're adding more ruggedized security requirements because, you know, now you have physical access to some of these devices. How do you ruggedize those? So how do you, you know, kind of harden those so that that is, you know, taken into consideration? I think, you know, Tony brought up the issue about autonomous operations, right? So um, if I have no network connection, how can I autonomously run an uh, edge side without having to? So as they take some of these cloud native workloads they've built and try to you know run them at the edge they're having to refactor a platform to take into consideration network um, you know dependencies you know it's not consistent hardware variability because in the cloud it's just commoditized hardware <laughs> here is the variety of hardware so there are some factors that you need to consider and i almost going to call it uh, uh, you know edge native or edge in approach because i know you know, Keith mentioned this as well. Well, taking cloud-like constructs and moving them to the edge. And, you know, my call out is we have to consider edge native requirements and cater for that, which are slightly different to just taking cloud-like constructs and pushing them to the edge. We have to take into right. consideration all of these requirements that are slightly different. All right, fair enough. Um, Saeed, uh, Muneeb mentioned sort of some of the things that people think they're just gonna merrily skip into, you know, doing edge computing and it's not just a, rip and replace or pull something out of the cloud, there's obviously considerations and challenges with edge computing. Maybe you'd be a good person to kick off that part of the, the panel of what, you know, you have abundant benefits of edge computing. Um, I think we see that uh, edge ends up being the first catcher's mitt, if you would, for a lot of especially control loop data and things that are time sensitive or they might be high volume. I'm thinking visual inspection of semiconductor manufacturing. You don't want to backhaul all that data. It's cost prohibitive, it's latency prohibitive. So you might deal with 100% of that at the edge, but maybe you, to Manib's point, take 30% of it from our surveys, send that back to the cloud, you send a summarization to maybe go de-bias models or whatever the case may be back at, uh, across multiple factories. Yeah. Um, but that comes at a cost, right? I mean, there's a number of considerations in that edge implementation that people need to be cognizant of before they embark on this journey. Maybe you can touch on some of those. I know we heard about security. Yeah. Um, scalability, uh, obviously uh, orchestration and manageability always come to play. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, um, so building on that, I think, first of all, like the the, the work, what we have seen that the primary right for computing is streaming data, right? There's constant data generated from something, machine, a camera, <laughs> sensor, and video obviously is the, the most extreme version, I think, of streaming data effectively, right? But it's generating tremendous amount of data um, and you have to process that data, can upload it to the cloud, Bandwidth is one problem, but there's many others. So instead you want to process that data on-prem. It could be an AI model, could be Azure IoT Edge with you know with a very easy modules to analyze. There's many ways, or K3S with, uh, with containers. There's many ways how you can do it. But those are sort of, I think, the idea there. What we typically see, and I talked about this earlier, you know, why is edge computing accelerating is because there's a lot of data being collected today. And a lot of those um, collection systems are legacy. A lot of them actually run Windows. 90% of the workloads today in OT are based on Windows. They're not based on Linux. I mean, I know we, we it's hard to believe <laughs> when you think about where, where we are in the cloud. But, Blood you know, trickling out of the edge of Keith's mouth. We've got, we've got customers taking support <laughs> Windows XP, you know, like very modified versions of it. I'm like, what? <laughs> Which version? You know, so, so you have to figure out a way how to coexist and integrate with those existing environments. And the other thing is customers hate if you go in and say, we well, got to change your app in order to do edge computing, mm -hmm. especially that app that's collecting data, took them decades to build and stabilize. So the fusing of cloud workloads and cloud native capabilities with existing environments, uh, SCADA or whatever else, and, and putting that together with security, with manageability, I think is one of the biggest things that customers are, are, are trying to figure out right now. Uh -huh. um, especially in these verticals that are by nature more earlier to adopt edge than others. So, so supporting legacy workloads in combination with new workloads and doing that in a very consistent, easy manner without changing the actual original application is, is golden in my mind. That, that, is, that is the biggest challenge we're seeing as well. Um, folks and organizations that are new to edge, um, we, we have to educate them on how to think differently, right? And so for any uh, edge solution, particularly one that's cloud native, we see three pillars that are required, almost an MVP, if you will. One is an operating system that's lightweight to uh, Manip's point, can be run on Intel architecture, possibly 
architecture, whatever the hardware is, you want to be able to say yes to that OS option, right? So lightweight, container focused, immutable, security footprint is very low because of the hostility there at the edge, for example. Uh, the second pillar is the equivalent, but at the K, uh, the Kubernetes layer. So in, in our case, it's K3S, it's lightweight, it's multi-architecture, it's a CNCF certified distro, so you can check the box there. And then the third is managing that complexity at massive scale, right? So how do you deploy 10,000 of those, right? Um, how do you deploy 15,000 or even be on the low end, 600 that are in moving vehicles, right? So the management uh, complexity, that's a huge challenge that people don't realize uh, when it comes to the topology of the network from a pull versus push model, for example, uh, for those disconnected environments that need to you know, remain disconnected and act as their own small failure domain. Um, so those three pillars are critical uh, to, to, for customers to understand before they embark on a true cloud native edge story and journey. Excellent. Yeah, I, I I totally agree with you know everything Kathan said. Uh, we see the uh, the same challenges you know as a hyperscale you know cloud provider you know the and, and we're working on all of these challenges right uh, ourselves and with our partners like Zadata and you know I think the important thing is you know first and foremost is security you know it's it's really important. And, uh, you know, we have this Azure Defender for IoT where we can run, you know, these agent-less things and, and really manage, you know, a, uh, a wide-scale deployment. Second thing that Keith said is scalability. It's one thing to go manage, you know, like a few million devices. Now we're actually working with customers that are hitting half a billion devices that we have to manage in real time. And you have to aggregate that at the right edge points to bring the data in and have this nested architecture. And, you know, the, the last thing is exactly like Said said, the brownfield is the hardest part of the IoT problem to solve. There's just so much legacy types of equipment, protocols, operating systems to capture all that data, to bring it in, to process the, you know, intelligent AI applications at the right level, orchestrate it. And, and to do it at scale, you know, a lot of these big process manufacturing customers, honestly, in terms of IoT, they've been experimenting for the large part for the last few years. Now they're tasting and seeing the value. And as Munib said, you know, COVID has accelerated the need to do these things. Now they got to kind of like roll it out from one factory to 340 factories around the globe and manage it. And to Keith's point, make sure that when these things are air gapped or in disconnected mode that they still continue to work and when you know the connection back to the cloud is there they resync effortlessly everything just works and we got to kind of like mask all these problems from the customer and just make it work so yeah. still i'm not saying that all the problems are solved <laughs> far from it but it's more than one company can do and that's why these partnerships and the ecosystems are yeah. so important to us. I, I want to add something to Tony's statement because it's really powerful. Um, Microsoft, I, I got to give them credit here. Um, they launched an open source project called Akri, A-K-R-I, which is uh, basically a cloud native approach to uh, talking to the siloed protocols in the industrial IoT space. So the idea is that if you can install Aukri, you can get plugin support, you can now use your cloud native approaches to talk to um, an interface with these the siloed protocols out there in, in, in the space. I think that's a brilliant way to bring those folks into the modern world with trans transformation into this you know cloud native approach and, and have that fully managed. So I, it's, I just wanted to, to let people know about that and that we are participating in that upstream as well. And it's gonna to take, to Tony's point, the ecosystem to solve this. One vendor can't do it alone. Excellent. Uh, well, you know, I made the mistake of actually glancing at the Q&A section and there's this big long list of questions from the attendees. Um, you guys open to some, uh, some free for all with uh, the Q&A? Bring it on. Absolutely. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, I've never asked. Um, Oh, all right. <laughs> they all smile and lean in. This so he's going to take all the questions. <laughs> yes. That's why we're smiling. That's why we're leaning in because Saeed's got his cover. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. Manu, can you just, yeah. Um, so uh, I think we touched on this a little bit, but do you see edge AI ML use cases leveraging real-time data today? And if so, what use cases and verticals? I think, Tony, you mentioned oil and gas. Manu, you said it as well. I know I, I see that quite a bit, both production and exploration, actually, because the thumpers just generate seismic modeling. is just an insane amount of data. But what other what other use cases or verticals are you guys seeing? I'm seeing it in energy and utilities, like substation, substation, you know, communication, uh, manufacturing, obviously. Yeah. Also, we see retail quite a bit. It just like yeah. there's a lot of, uh, you know, not just the big box retailers, you know, but even like 7-Elevens, gas stations, things like that, that have a lot of a lot of legacy cameras and a site set cameras generated a lot of data, but you can't go replace them all. You can. You know, so you want to put an edge compute device to tap into it, make them smart, make real-time decisions, and then send what's necessary to the cloud. Uh, we see a lot of activities around sustainability, you know, water flow management, smart cities, you know, edge compute is important. And then there's a lot of areas where air gapping the workloads is also important. So those are like the additional areas to process manufacturing where we see edges coming up. And lastly, 5G, you know, working with all the operators around the globe, you know, they're working a lot of these advanced workloads as well. They're pushing those applications into retail, you know, healthcare for hospitals, clinics, those kind of environments and, you know, manufacturing. Yeah, no, I agree with Tony there. Like retail has been good. I think the other piece has also been logistics, right? So logistics have been interesting in this, again, where there's short supply uh, of things. And at the same time, distribution for, you know, um, the vaccinations, like, you know, talking to a healthcare farm. You know, uh, as you know, there's not a lot of people manufacturing them. How do they accelerate and get these going in logistics and track batches of, you know, vaccinations everywhere? So we've kind of all of that's happening at the edge. So um, retail for sure, logistics is, you know, tracking them in real time um, and beyond just, you know, manufacturing oil and gas and all of those. I think uh, uh, it's it's interesting times. This is where and, and then in, when it comes to logistics as well, um, it's it's. I almost call it a mobile edge because, you know, these guys are in motion. They're not static one location. So there are additional challenges in that that we've kind of encountering where these are mobile edge environments. And and to Tony's point, 5G and operators hand off between, you know, smart cells and how does that happen? So it's interesting challenges where you have now compute nodes uh, mobile and carrying a lot of data and, and passing different cell towers. So how do you in a federate between uh, different providers if there are multiple providers. So a um, whole amount of interesting challenges, right? That's going to be a lot of fun. Job security for us all for a few more decades. Yeah. Um, the, the other vertical I'd like to highlight is is uh, oil and gas. Um, it's, it's, it's a vertical that's going through significant change. I mean, first of all, it's always been a data-driven, very data-driven vertical, right? Um, the, the amount of processing and <laughs> computing and data analytics that happens there is, is, is quite unique. Um, uh, you know, but I think also oil and gas with the move to renewable, they're, they're also changing a lot of, you know, their operations, they're, you know, going into green energy. And that's the other vertical outside the energy market that has always been very early on adapting new technology, regardless if it's cloud or anything else, uh, because they're sort of the, the, the new kids on the block. Um, and so I think renewable energy it, through oil and gas, but also traditional renewable energy companies have been out there. I think they're extremely driven on edge computing. We have deployments in wind, solar farms, um, really helping to bring down the cost per watt um, and ultimately offer a you know a path out to you know carbon free world. So you know, so that's great. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I've got let's see, we've got five more minutes. I got a couple questions here that are getting a lot of thumbs up. So I'm going to pepper you guys maybe one at a time with these. Um, Tony, here's a good one for you. Uh, the cloud business model charges for compute and storage consumption, and how much of the movement of compute to the edge puts some of that cloud revenue at risk? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, honestly, we've been thinking about the monetization model, and we're trying to go away from just compute and storage, you know, the traditional IaaS model into more of a value-based, you know, what is the, you know, value of running a certain workload, regardless of, you know, where it lands in the in this hybrid architecture. So we're kind of constantly are looking for those new business models and kind of like here's a PaaS service on top of the cloud, regardless of where you want to run it. 
and kind of like how do we, you know, price it based on that. We're also constantly are looking at, you know, more, you know, uh, you know, packaged type of solution. So you have a collection of services in the cloud or the edge that's necessary to run certain workloads. Like how do we make it easier, pre-assemble, packaged, and priced at that level, regardless of where it's running. So those are the models that we're looking at, but uh, it is a it, it is a different model because before everything was on the cloud. Now, like, hey, a lot of this hap- action is on the edge. What do we do with it? So we're looking at all those different models. I would not want to be on in one of your internal team meetings where you have some some set of people with one revenue stream and another set of people with a different revenue stream, and they get to play nice together. Um, so um, maybe one for Keith. Um, here's one. If one compares edge to cloud in terms of usage, do you see a pay-as-you-consume billing model on edge? It seems like the upfront costs are particularly for hardware and setup and controller. Is that one you're comfortable with? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's similar to, to Tony's question. Um, from our perspective, we define the edge in three categories. Near is kind of telcos and communications providers. The far is customer-owned gear. And so for the use cases we see, there's a CapEx cost, which is largely one time given over, you know, amortized over some period of time, but it's not the same billing model that you see from uh, the cloud providers. So um, we see that as the primary business model where they spend once for the infrastructure and maybe there's a licensing fee or subscription fee for some of the software that runs on that infrastructure, but it's not pay, pay as you go, pay by the minute, pay by the hour. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of those use cases, though, have, let's say, thousands of remote locations that have that, you know, that same CapEx model we just described, but they're they're managed by something in the cloud. So if it's running on you know, AKS with Microsoft, then they would pay for the hosted service on Microsoft running something like Rancher as the control plane. But downstream, the business model will be very different. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, we got two minutes left, so I'm going to try something. This is a big risk. <laughs> We're gonna, this is uh, this is panelist discipline time. So, uh, do each of you want to do maybe thirty seconds of parting thoughts and uh, any takeaways of things we didn't cover? And Saeed, I'm gonna have you go last if that's all right, since this is your event. You get to close it all up. You guys, you guys comfortable doing thirty seconds, just wrapping it up? Yeah. Yeah. Let's roll. All right. Go. Cool. Okay, <laughs> Keith, you're on. Okay. Um, uh, three pillars: uh, cloud focused operating system, uh, uh, easy to use. Uh, Kubernetes option in the form of K3S. It's just really easy to use. Uh, no cognitive overload there and management of scale. Those are your big three pillars. I would add another one that's future facing. Um, make sure your architecture can run in a fully disconnected environment. We're, we're driven by some of the security profiles with the Department of Defense and the US military, uh, sorry, the intelligence community. Um, those are That's a great breeding ground to do things right in, in the commercial industry. So uh, I'll leave it at that in my 30 seconds. <laughs> Great time discipline, uh, Manip. Sure. No, I agree with like Keith. Like from our perspective, it's three areas. Like uh, you need a platform, right? Like we've been talking about the the price and the platform, right? So my simplest analogy is when you build a house, you still build, you know, your plumbing and and electricity lines. But even though it's all a utility, right? So you got to make that initial investment. There is a platform. There's a set of services that you got to run, which are from everywhere, and then obviously build apps on top of that. I think you got to think about that being an IT OT platform with services that are truly multi cloud that you can pick and choose from, and applications which are built for the edge. Um, I'll leave you with that thought. Excellent. Thanks, Manith. You guys are, you guys are so well behaved panelists. Tony, are you going to misbehave for us? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with Manith. You do need a hyperscale cloud platform, and the answer is obvious. I don't know. I don't need to tell you which one. But in addition to that, uh, you know, on a serious note, I think it starts uh, with an A, right, Tony? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, the, the other thing that's important is really uh, it's uh, you know it's easier said than done, but like that single management pane the portability of these workloads, the unified security and identity, I can't tell you how important it is. It seems like like simple things, but it's not when you get to that level of distributed architecture. And lastly, I would say partnerships. You know, that's why we're so excited about working with Zadata. Thank you for having us here. But it's really, it takes a village to build these solutions and take it out to the market. Excellent. Thanks, Tony. Saeed, take us home. 
Great, thank you. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank all of you uh, today for joining on the panel. Uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, and thank you for joining our event and supporting our event. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with each of you as well, and uh, I'm really looking forward to some great things together in the next uh, 12 months. Um, I think the parting thoughts, listen, I, I think we are still at the very early days of edge computing. Uh, the, the, we don't know the answer yet. We, a lot of things we're still learning as we go, but I think we're going to learn it together. And I think by partnering together, by by not, you know, this is not a zero sum game. This is such a huge shift. There's going to be so much opportunity created. And I think partnerships and focusing on the customer outcomes and driving real use cases is how we're going to get there. Um, and, and all I can say is thank, thank you for all for, again, for all your support.